my, I'm in my shower and I'm washing my hair and I felt this presence come into my little bathroom there, my little single wide trailer, Martin Kemp. And the Lord put in my heart said, there's a devil out there that you need to deal with. And now this is while she's pregnant with Savannah, my first child. And I said, okay, he'll wait. So I finished washing my hair and I knew he was still there. So I opened up the, the, the shower oh, in the spirit, not in the natural, but I saw in the spirit, this twisted, deformed, hairy looking little creature that said, I've got your baby. And of course, you know, I didn't do it just as how he said it, but he said, I've got your baby. I said, no, you don't. In the name of Jesus, said, the blood of Jesus is against you. And I said, I, I bind you and you can't have her in Jesus' name. Now I tell you to go, never, never to come back. Well, he left. When Savannah was born, she was born with her legs broken. We took her to Shriners Hospital in Lexington. Shriners said, well, she should probably have to be in braces or maybe have some surgery, but we can get this correct, we think. And just in my heart, there's something scratching at my guts. I just knew that it wasn't the will of God, that uh, we were to pray and believe God for healing and, you know, in her life. We got outside the hospital. <laughs> Glory to God. <clears throat> we, we got outside that hospital. And we prayed for Savannah. She's, you know, I guess she's probably two. Might have been two years old at the time. Sorry to cry so much, but no, just, I'm crying kind of with you, man. You're yeah. all right. Yeah. And we just laid, we just laid hands on, prayed for her right then. And I'm telling you, within months, her legs started straightening up. There oh, were times okay. when we said, "Sissy, you need to, you need to, you need to watch your leg. You need to straighten your legs up. Watch how you're walking." And within months, she was completely and totally healed and restored. I truly believe that if I did not know how to take care of that spirit, she would have been maybe significantly deformed. We got to do what the Word of God said. Our actions needs to harmonize with our current level of faith. The Lord is so patient and his grace is so good. He told me I was coming back to our community. So when I come back, the Lord was speaking to my heart about having a Christian owned and operated, listen to Christian music. I always make a joke. It's like the Chick-fil-A of beauty shops. You know, the Lord's hairdos. I don't know. This lady, she challenged me. And the crazy thing is, is she was born again Christian. And she said, you cannot have a, a beauty shop like this. You cannot speak freely about Jesus in a beauty shop like this. She said, you got to make up your mind. She said, do you want a beauty shop or do you want a church? Wow. And I'm like, well, if that's the question you're, you're presenting to me right now. I say church because we're <laughs> church, we gathered in his name. He will be in the midst. If I can cut hair and have church at the same time, it's exactly what I'm going to do. I knew too also that Lord had spoke something very, very deep in my heart. And I've even been ridiculed. And it's okay because I'm not mad about it. One time I was called a prude to my face, you know, and you know, and I'm like, God, if loving you and trying to reach out and minister and create an atmosphere where people can love you and people can feel free to talk about you and Jonathan the crazy thing is is in that place in that beauty shop where I want Jesus glorified that's all I've ever wanted for that beauty shop is for Jesus to be glorified and if that means that some people don't understand, that's okay. I'm not mad about it. It's okay. Yeah, it's a beauty shop, and I'm doing my best, you know, to lift God up in that place. But, you know, we saw someone healed of cervical cancer there. Wow. We saw a little baby get his hearing back there. There. We saw a woman come to Christ there. But that lady doesn't stop. Wow. God it's lit her on fire and the little my co-worker jessica she found jesus there jessica told me one day she said she told me she said do you know what i was dealing with anxiety she said but i walk through these doors anxiety goes she said i don't deal with anxiety anymore
Yo, it hey. is time to get started today. Let's do this. Guys, let me turn this music down a little bit. All right, so welcome to Faith, The Faith Chronicles, where we have true stories of people encountering the extraordinary God. I'm telling you, we got an awesome, awesome episode planned for you today. If you ever go through the podcast, you're like, I need some good, godly, practical advice on stewardship, on money. This is the episode for you today. Oh man, we have a great guest today. Um, He's a business owner. Um, He is just financially got his head on straight and uh, he's going to really run us through some scriptures, some Bible, biblical, practical things. He's going to go run us through some testimonies, maybe, that he has. Whatever happens, it's going to be good. So, it's Joel. Be good. Excited. What do you got, man? What do you want to say? Well, I'm excited. It's our uncle. Um, yeah. I forgot. He's, <laughs> yeah. he's my uncle. He's my boss. He's your boss. Yeah. Um, but, no, I'm excited. Uh, been, you know, first and foremost, witnessed kind of how he grew you know um just seeing it kind of from the ground up seen a lot of things that obviously not a whole lot of people seen and there's a lot more that i didn't see um and just to see how he's elevated just incredible wow. it's incredible yeah. you know yeah he's always somebody i've always looked up to um, me too, for sure he's always been uh one of those core men in my life it's no joke, man, and, and that's it, dude. He's been a great, great example for both of us. And we're not just puffing you up, Bill. Bill's on the – he's in the other room just kind of waiting. He's like, <laughs> when he gets on here, man, uh, it's going to be great. But uh, we got some Bible scriptures here. Uh, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 25. I'm going to th- start this up and let Joe, uh, Joel finish it up before we in- introduce Bill. But Proverbs 28, 25, it says, The greedy stir up conflict, but those who trust in the Lord – will prosper listen man god i mean who else should we trust in yeah. you know what i'm saying like yeah <laughs> i was thinking about my 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 uncle bill man he's uh you know he's got way more money than i do but he is <laughs> listen like i can't just go to bill i could you know say i could go to bill and say hey man could you help me out but yeah. wisdom says listen you can't just trust and man, you can't just trust in yourself. Cause man, l- listen, Bill could be like, listen, I, I I can help you out. But dude, you're a man, you gotta do your thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And listen, I can't trust in my own abilities. I gotta trust in God to help me prosper. I gotta trust in him. Joe, what do you got, brother? Exactly. Just kind of piggyback off what you said, man. Me and you had a conversation earlier this week just talking about the goodness of God and how he's continued to bless us. Yeah. And um uh, never went without you know i've never had a whole lot but never went without um and hopefully bill can teach me how to be a good steward and i'm excited about it but this is this is kind of what touched my heart here because this is what i always rely on kind of what you said god is our source it ain't no man it ain't no job and it ain't the lottery you know god is our source yeah. Come on, dude. psalms 50 verse 7 says here oh my people i will speak oh israel And I will testify against thee, I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor the goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee. For the world is mine and the fullness thereof, man. That's where it comes from. You, you got some cattle you think you own them you're wrong they're gods <laughs> but no yeah. he he just he provides man over and over again you know exactly so be, that's it man that's it this is all about god guys we are going to introduce somebody that has encountered the extraordinary god bill has told me some stories i'm not going to say it for him uh, i'm not going to tell you all what god has on his heart for him if that makes sense so uh without further ado man let's get bill on here bill we appreciate you man everybody welcome bill ratliff what's up guys how's it going man i felt like jerry springer sitting back here you know like (laughs) getting called out like (laughs) 
<laughs> and everything going on. I'm like, oh, here I come. No, I'm just... <laughs> Jerry, not, Jerry. You're not the dad. No, I'm just... <laughs> 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 awesome man bill it's good to have you man it's right good to on, have dude. you we've waited a long time for this i've been asking bill to get on here for a while and life is busy um <sighs> we actually planned on having him on here like last october or something and i got crazy busy bill got busy and finally we're here man so good to have you man right on man we're talking about one of uh my favorite subjects so i'm really looking forward to it for sure yeah so God kind of put it on your heart uh, about money and all that. But before we get into that, if we can, man, just tell us, I mean, you said that, that the, you know, money is a passion for you because it is a great tool that God uses and God can use for your life. God tells us to provide for our families, man. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? If we're not, we're worse than an infidel, worse than we should never be born again. You know, we should never be born. And, Absolutely. uh, but before we get into that, that can be part of this question I'm about to ask you, man. But in introducing yourself as Bill Ratliff, what's your passion, man? What makes you tick? You know, transparently, uh, the number one thing I, I think that I'm most passionate about is me and my wife is about freedom. Um, freedom from, you know, just all things. Obviously, there's some areas that I need some freedom from. You know, I eat just a little bit too much, you know, so I need... <laughs> I, Joe has got me beat on the health freedom thing. Absolutely. Me too. So. Me too. Not entirely. Not, Kudos, not quite where bro. I want to be. Uh, so maybe I can help you. You help me. How about that? Let's um, do it. You know, and if you're going to say Jenny Craig, I'm out. The, uh, no. No. <laughs> <Jenny Craig. laughs> no, I can't do it. I can't do it. All right, no. I'm not going to dance to uh, what, Booty Army or something like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I ain't going to do that. You know, it can't be emasculating the man, you know. That's yeah, right. but you know, transparently, it's freedom. You know, that was something yeah. that we were really passionate about with our kids. Um, what does that mean? Um, you know, we're all kind of indoctrinated to be employees. Everybody is. Mm -hmm. um, you go to school at seven thirty in the morning. Uh, you might get a break here and there, but then you got lunchtime, and then you know an hour there for lunchtime, and then you uh, go home for the day at five o'clock, and you get to do whatever you can do for the next two hours till the sun goes down. And then you're back in the house going to bed and you start rinse and repeat. And that that's kind of the, the, you know, the programming that we have to be employees, you know, and, right. you know, transparently do, do I think, no, I think employees is a phenomenal thing. I think it's what you do with your money that matters. Uh, so it isn't about, you know, how much money I make. It isn't about, you know, uh, there's high uh, earned income earners. There's middle, you know, income earners and there's low income earners. And I know low income earners with a higher net worth than high in, uh, income earners. And the reality is majority of high income earners are vastly in debt. So that's right. something me and my wife both are very, very passionate about. My wife is a business major. Um, she runs all the finances of our company. Uh, you know, we're both pretty invested in the real estate as well. Uh, invested, you know, in some some investments in stocks and things like that, but it's not like our passion by no means. Sure. Um, we we do help a ton of people when it comes to structuring their companies and you know getting those advice. So she's really good on the legal side of it, and I'm really good on the managing side of it. You know how you should see it as a business owner. Wow. So hope that answers your question, man. Uh, all of my kids, you know, for transparently, uh, we got five kids. Uh, the oldest is 24. He graduated college. He is a school teacher. He's a football coach. Um, he, uh, also purchased a house just a year after graduating college. Uh, the he other played for Kent state. Yeah. I played football, Kent state, <laughs> yeah. played a little division one football. And, um, then, uh, my other kids, you know, all have bought houses. As a matter of fact, my daughters are in their second houses and they're both under, uh, 21. Um, then, uh, my son, Noah, I think he's purchased at this point seven or eight and he's like 22 years old. Yeah. Well, wow. That's awesome, man. Well, thank you for saying that. Dude. Uh, yeah. Appreciate it. We, um, in, um, I had a question now. I forgot it. Joel, do you got anything? <laughs> uh, let's start from the beginning, man. Right on, man. Like, where'd you come from? All right. 
Where'd so, you go? You all from Appalachia, Kentucky, like I was. Okay, yeah. you you guys were poor. Okay, I was po. <laughs> There's a difference. Okay? <laughs> I was much poorer than you. Um, I lived in subsidized housing, housing, aka the projects in Appalachia, Eastern Kentucky. So there, everybody in Appalachia, Eastern Kentucky, for about ninety-five percent of the people there are below the, uh, you know, the poverty level. You know, yeah. it's the number ten poorest city in the united states where we grew up at i don't know if y'all knew that's that. crazy okay no. Wow. no i lived in the projects in that town you know what i'm saying <laughs> well, dude i was telling mel i said at eight years old i knew what uh working under the table meant at eight years old wow that, that was a thing dude that was the education we had yeah. you know keep your social security keep your welfare checks keep your food stamps you know, we got me and my mom got paid sixty three dollars a month to live where we lived. You know, um, yeah, we got paid to live there. You know, uh, that, that's when you know it's like all bad. But um, <laughs> you know, but uh, the reality of it was is there was something that was really stood out to me even at a young age that I was watching these grown men like playing basketball all day long. These yeah. dudes were in the thirties, forty years old, but they were saying that they were hurt and unable to work. You know, wow, yeah. I, I knew immediately there was a lot of bull going on, you know, just a lot of jacked up stuff. You know, people were trading pills for income. They were trading food stamps for income. Everything was under the table. Um, everybody that lived there, well, you couldn't have husband and wife married living under the same roof. So they were wow. either claiming legally separated or they were divorced and still living together. You know, wow. yeah, yeah. So, and you kind of pick up on that stuff real early because you're like, okay, this is jacked up. And kids around the area turn it into this great big joke, you know, like this yeah. is hilarious, you know. Yeah. yeah. So that to answer your question, Joe, that definitely changed my mindset as I got older. Plus, you know, all the labels that that people had put on me, that that Satan had put on me, the lies, you know, that that people were trying to get me to believe, which was, you know, I had one person said I'd never make about ten dollars an hour. Um, I had people tell me that I'd never graduate high school. You know, I had people wow. tell me that, man, all the lies. You know, I was dyslexic, dyslexic ADHD, um, all those, you know, things that went along with that. Um, you know, I was at, at the time when I was younger, I was in special education. I actually tested out about my sophomore year just to prove everybody that, you know, I could do it. And I, got, I ended up graduating with like a 3.8, 3.5. Oh, wow. Nice. I have pretty much pretty good, pretty decent grades. It wasn't bad. You know, I wasn't bad. I, I had uh, set myself up early on with some trickery, but, the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what, yeah. <laughs> the reality of it is, is I stopped believing the lies. And yeah. was, but I think maybe moving 17 schools had a little bit to do with me adjusting to school. Wow. That might have been a problem. <laughs> Um, the reality of it was, is that and I started just saying, I don't, I don't want this for my family. I don't want this for my life. And, and I want to do better than this. So I had, a, uh, God sent somebody in my life who put a book in my hand and that's where it started at all. Wow. Nice. Well, what book was that? If you don't mind me asking. I got it here, dude. I paid all my kids 50 bucks to read this in the ele in elementary school. And then again, oh, wow. in high school. Yeah. That book right there. Wow. Rich, yeah, poor, that's a great book. I've read it probably three times. Funny Very. story. Funny story. I first started working for Bill whenever I was 19. Bill told me, I'm going to pay you $9 an hour. If you read this book, I'll bump you up a dollar. I never read the book. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fact. Was I paying you that low? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Dang. Right out of high school, man. I, I had to learn. It's, uh, it's fine though. I was a gopher. I mean, I was just yeah, a gopher. Yeah, that is true. <laughs> I hey. learned a lot. I did learn a lot. But that's hey, that's where I started. So that's all yeah. good. That's back. That's back. No, I'm just joking. Right out of high school. But uh but no, like you could just see kind of like what you're saying. Like you could see that I look back now, I'm 32, and I look back now and it's like Oh, I just accepted that. Mm -hmm. I was content in that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think there's a lot of things, uh, like we talked about the gym. Like, there's a lot of things with the gym I just don't accept. I don't accept a failure of a, of a set. I won't accept uh, doing a set incorrectly whenever I'm trying to target a muscle group. Um, I just won't accept it. If I fail, well, I'm going to take me a second, 
recoup for a minute, and then we'll get back at it. Mm-hmm. And so there's just a lot of things that I don't accept in the gym, and I started comparing that to the rest of my life of what I accept. And it's not perfect in a lot of areas, and it's like that's the goal, right, is you want to be free. Mm-hmm. And the more free you are, the more you'll – begin to dive in and start to not be perfect, but get closer to that goal of being perfect. Absolutely. hundred percent. Well, and that's, here's the thing, man. I desire that so much. Like I'm going to give it right back to bill real quick, but Joel, no it's about, it is about freedom. That's, that's what we desire in life. Yeah. I think if you are not competing with the Joneses, like you understand, okay, I don't have to compete with the Joneses. I just want freedom. I think that's going to break a lot of that mentality. Ask any inmate that's locked up, and he'll tell you, all I want is freedom. Yeah. All I want is freedom. But then we're just so content that we're not inmates. That's what it comes down to. 100%, dude. I mean, you think about it, man. At the end of the day, um, Paul says to be content no matter what state that I'm in. All right. And the first thing that I had to figure out to wealth was real simple. I had a friend of mine. Uh, I'm just going to call him Papa. OK, a uh, close friend of mine. And he sold one of his businesses for seventy five million dollars. So the dude was very, very wealthy. Um, he's probably net worth somewhere around five, six hundred million dollars. And he's my mentor, somebody I call all the time. I really do. We just, you know, we're, we're friends, you know. Wow. And uh, one of the things that I learned about him is as he drove around to this 1985 El Camino. Uh, which is kind of hilarious because the car had like 200,000 miles on it. It was nothing special. Like this is like, now with this guy, this guy has barns of cars. I have drove some of his cars. They are insane. They are sick. Uh, matter of fact, I had him white as a ghost in the McLaren. Uh, it was a, it was a fun time. Okay. Um, if you ever learn to drive in Eastern Kentucky, you know, what's up. You go on flat <laughs> roads. It's like, you're looking for curves. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Um, the, uh, but the guy is as humble as you would ever see. You know, I always talk about the fake rich and the real wealthy. There's a big difference between the fake rich and the real, and the real wealthy. Okay, the real wealthy are content. Dude, they're just happy. You know, he don't really need anything. Um, he's just happy. Now, he, he hates people that look for handouts all the time because he, he realizes that they have an issue with the love of money, that that's a heart condition. So he's not trying to even cater to a handout. His whole focus and mindset is towards you got to be content with whatever state that you're in. You got to be happy right where you are. And if you can't learn to be happy where you're at, man, then you're never going to have a dime because you're always going to think everybody has more than you. Everybody has it better than you. Uh, Some people just comes easy to, well, let me squash all of that. There's no such thing as anything coming easy to anybody. You know what I'm saying? And the one, the fake rich, want to talk about the fake rich, if you know that, you know, the type, the one who roll up in the bougie car with the bougie clothes, you know what I'm saying? Living in the bougie house. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Those are the fake rich. Okay. Um, the real wealthy man, they're hub Klein. I don't know if you guys know hub, you know, when I found out hub owned a couple mines, when I thought found out hub was pretty wealthy, it blew my mind. Wow. Because I've I seen this happy guy, this loving guy, this joyous guy who drove around in this red single cab beater with a heater. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. With a yeah. smash front end. And this guy was just the happiest man on earth. And yeah. I was like, next to your dad, John. The um, But the, re- <laughs> the reality is the hub was content. Yeah. Hub was, you just wanted to be around him. You know, you right. just wanted to be in his presence. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And... Man, when you realize that Hub is extremely wealthy, like very wealthy, um, then you realize that Hub had figured something. He found something out. He found out that money don't make you happy. You know, money, things don't make you happy. Dude, I have been to, <clears throat> I've watched the sunrises in Cabo. I've watched the sunrises in the Virgin Islands. You know, I have been to, I've seen wells go breach out of the water. You know, I've been uh, riding, uh, doom bugging in the backs of, you know, Mexico, you know, I've done just about everything that you can imagine that blew my water stream. I never thought I'd make it out of Martin County. You know what I mean? <laughs> and the reality of it is, is, is all these things. The most important thing is just walking with my wife. Wow. Yeah. You know, you know, seeing my kids at Cracker Barrel and we snap in a family picture, 
you know, watching my granddaughter take her steps to pap, you know what I'm saying? Wow, yeah. Bro, that, that's the stuff that matters, yeah. you know? And then yeah. you realize that money just simply don't matter. Like, it, right. it really has no value. It truly does depreciate. But I saw the love of money for real up close and personal. And I saw what real wealth looks like. The love of money was actually, I saw that in the projects. That's where I saw that. Wow. That's wow. crazy. If you don't mind me asking, what makes you say that? So the 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 Po, as you say it, the Po down in Riverside, you know what I'm saying? Down the, down the projects. You said you said West Side of Kentucky, son. It might, it might have been East. We don't know. <laughs> it really shows. It's not the show. But, um what makes you say that they had a different like we we see love of money as the rich you know when we first see that scripture the love of money is the root of all evil but you really kind of threw us a curveball there what do you mean by the po having <laughs> a sense a, a mindset of a love of the love of money we all still struggle with that little bit of poverty inside of us you know what i'm saying so when i said the love of money is the root of all evil that's where I saw it. I saw people trading their prescription drugs for money. You know, I saw people trading their food stamps. I saw people working under the table. I saw people that was manipulating, lying, stealing, and cheating all the time as a way of life. You know, I saw people like that would steal baseball cards as kids. They taught it to their kids. So the kids are stealing baseball cards, stealing stereo systems, stealing all that stuff to try and, and justifiably thinking wow. that they're justifiably in doing that. And the reality of it is, man, is that that's where the love of money is. You're wanting stuff. You know, you want those shoes. You want those clothes. You want those riches. You want validation. You want identity. Come on. That's what they're really after. So they're not saying, I don't know who I am in Christ. So therefore, I got to find my value. So I'm going to roll up in these, you know, these J's with this car, with this music, with this look, with this persona, with this perception. Yeah. Right. And I'm going to steal from whoever I can to get it. I'm going to manipulate. Real wealthy people don't do that. Abraham didn't do that in the Bible. Come on. So if we're talking about the real wealthy, Abraham gave his stuff to Isaac. Abraham had mass land. Okay. Yeah. Abraham had mass workers, people that worked around him. Abraham had, it was, it was vast. It went to Isaac and it rolled on downhill from there all the way to King David of Solomon, the whole nine yards. Well, we have, you know, what that heritage. Yeah. The reality of it is, is those guys didn't love things. So therefore they didn't desire things because they didn't desire things. They put their money in things that had value. Right. So they bought land, they bought cattle, they bought sheep. Well, nobody's going around saying, Hey, what's up, man? Look at my sheep. <laughs> right you know what i'm saying <laughs> yeah you know now maybe some dudes do i don't know i've do <laughs> seen him at the fair looking at whatever you know. some people take pride in that too i think you can take pride in anything would you, would, <laughs> go ahead would you say that the desperation of money would attach itself to the foundation of the love of money it's the root of poverty it's, it's the desperation yeah it's the it's the mentality of the poverty yeah well wow. it, it's the very core of it <laughs> Protect, hide, and get as much as I can. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's well, what, that uh, The idea is I had to break that in me. I had to break that reality of, of even in early on a business to where I just had to be transparent. I had to come home and say, you know what? I'm not going to hide that I'm marketing this way. So guess what? I'm pulling permits on every single job that we do. I don't care if it needs permits or not. I had uh, people going in and knocking on doors to pull permits in places that had dirt floors. And wow. I'm like, pull the permit. And they're like, Bill, we don't need the permit here. They don't even know what we're talking about. <laughs> it, I did a job in Kentucky, uh, Joe, for your mom's beauty salon, the, the Haven, right? Mm -hmm. And I pulled a permit for that job. The city inspector came down from Franklin County, he drove from Lexington to pass that permit, okay? Wow. He looked at Michelle and said, why in the world did they pull a permit to do this job? And here's why. Because where I'm from in Columbus, Ohio, it is illegal 
to do jerk to do work without it. Oh no. So I'm going to go above and beyond on every single job to make sure that I'm wow. above the margins. I'm not going to say, hey, let's let's go to the margins and try to see how how we cannot reach there. No, no, forget that. I'm going up here. We're going to make sure that we right. do things at a higher level. Does that make sense? We're yeah. going to dominate the integrity. And, and when you have that mentality, that's not a poverty mentality. So the poverty mentality is stand of the wire, hide from anybody that may know and try to get away with whatever you can get away with. Ooh, yeah. That's a poverty mentality. Don't make too much money because then I'll lose my food stamps. Don't make too much money. Then, you know, it, let's take it from a situation of that. Then they begin to judge those that are wealthy. They're, yeah. you know, they're, they're horrible people. And the fact of the matter is, man, I've met more wealthy people who love God, who are good, just good people that make people make the decisions for themselves to achieve their dreams. They want you to own the fishing pole. They want, they want to give you the fishing pole. You ever go up to a true wealthy person and ask them how they get there, get your coffee, chill out for a while, give it a couple hours. You're about to hear a story because they want you to achieve it. Mm. Wow. That's good, man. That's good. So, <clears throat> So today, I mean, so far we've, we've talked a little bit about money and we got God involved too. I just want to uh, see if you would allow the, the congregation, whoever's listening out there, how did God come into the picture? You know, you're raised up in this crazy neighborhood, had this poverty mindset, and then God comes into the picture somehow. If you could kind of let us in on that. Well, there was some things that, you know, I feel like, okay, first of all, I'm going to tell you how I got into HVAC, and that's kind of funny. Okay. All right. So when I realized that football was not going to be an option for me, I just realized that I, I really had ambitions and to really play football somewhere, and that was a goal. You know, it was a true goal, and I realized that it just wasn't going to happen. So I went up in our, our high school, and I sat down at a computer, and I wrote, what pays the most money with the least amount of education? Okay. <laughs> and it said – the trades. I said, okay, cool. I'm going in the trades. What trade on average produces the most money? And it said HVAC. I said, wow. sweet, I'm going into HVAC. All right. So I did. Um, so here's what happened. Got to college, realized I didn't have enough money to pay for college. And I was kind of screwed on that aspect. And I didn't want a ton of debt. So I asked the guy, I said, hey, how do I graduate? What do I get when I graduate? They said, well, you get this test. And I'm saying, okay, sweet. How do I take the test? And the guys, no, you can't just do that. I said, well, okay, what if I could? And <laughs> yeah. they, so I, I did. I went and took the test and I quit college and I went to work for a maintenance company. And uh, when I went to work for a maintenance company, um, I got experience in working with HVAC at that time. I started at about 21 ish, somewhere in that area, got hired on an HVAC company. And man, I just kept grinding, I just kept learning all I could learn. Climbed the ladder quick, went to Tucson, Arizona, was a national trainer uh, for York International, became a national trainer, came back with that same job, uh, was still training people uh, on how to do HVAC in addition to how to carry yourself and communicate from an HVAC perspective. Um, then I said, you know, next step, uh, I started getting into, at that point in time, I ran into a guy. We went golfing, okay? Now, this is a true story. My job at the time was... Um, I made about 150000 a year. Um, and people would say, oh, man, he was making great money. Let me tell you right now, that's a, that's a poverty mentality. Hmm. That's an utter poverty mentality. If I make $150,000 a year, I have succeeded. I have made it. I am done. Wow. I'll be on a beach somewhere retiring. No, you won't. You will be broke as a joke. You'll have a whole lot of problems. You're, you're, now you got more debt that you can't afford. You're, wow. you're now in trouble. Now you're in trouble. You think you're you think you're paid. You're you're fake. You're fake rich. You know what I'm saying? It's a facade. You're not. It's not real. So it's like, whoa, whoa. What do you mean? Well, maybe if I made two hundred fifty thousand. No. Now you're just in more debt. Okay. Now you're now you're just a bigger dummy. You know what I'm saying? Um, but the reality of it is, I I went to work every day about ten o'clock. Got home at about three o'clock. Um, it was making really really good money. I had big accounts set up, and a guy looked at me a real a real wealthy person. His name is JR. I can mention him because he's no longer with us. Um, he looked at me and said, Bill, I see you got a family and I really like you. So I'm going to give you some advice. He said, I, I see that you're hungry. What are you hungry for? I said, man, I'm hungry not to be what I grew up in. Hmm. 
I want my kids to achieve what I never had, you know, and I'm not talking about stuff or things. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about killing their self for the almighty dollar. I want them to find freedom. I want them out of this mess. That's my goal. And he goes, okay, I want to start you out. Let's read this book. And he gave me Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And first book ever in my life. True story. <laughs> I, was, I love to read the Bible. I love to study the Bible. But to say read a book outside of the Bible, no, nah, I wasn't doing it, man. I came yeah. back to him and I, I read the book in like two days. Okay. Wow. I came back to him and I said, dude, I read what's stupid, man, is I'd be in so much trouble right now. I read the whole book while I was driving because my job required a lot of driving. So I would drive like two or three hours all the time. And I, I did. Thank God for those rumble strips. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I'm alive. I was an idiot. Oh, yeah, feel bad. I felt that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I read that book and went back to him. And then he gave me another book. And he gave me E-Myth. And then he gave me another book. And he, uh, uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People. And I just kept, from that point on, man, I've read thousands of books concerning uh, finances. And the biggest thing that I learned more so than anything was that, is that the carrot is always going to be dangled if that's what you're chasing. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So what did it, what do you mean? Well, I had to start looking at net worth and not stuff that, that I felt worth. Mm. Y'all follow me on that? I'm yeah. Again. yeah. Not, not, I needed to look at net worth not stuff that made me feel worth. Yeah. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what I'm trying to say, man, in that aspect is there's things that you buy, things that you do that make you feel valuable. If mm -hmm. I have a new car, I feel valuable. If I have new clothes, I feel valuable. If I have a new house, I feel valuable. If somebody ever says I'm ashamed of the, the, what they're saying is I feel value if I had this. Wow. Does that make sense? Yeah. And the reality of it is I, I think now I had to change my mindset from that to, okay, legacy, which the Bible is all about that, especially mm -hmm. in Proverbs, and net worth, value, things that have value. See, money has no value. Money depreciates. You could bury $100 in your backyard, go back another year, dig it back up, and your $100 is worth less money than it was when you buried it. Right. Yeah. Does that make uh, sense? Yeah, it does. I feel like I've been rambling on. You guys have any questions so far? You want me to keep uh, that's going? That's good. That's yeah. good. Um, Joel? No, I think you're good, man. Like, I'm just writing notes over here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> me too, dude. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try to jump back into real quick. Just, if you can, highlight, like, when did God come into this picture? Um because I believe, like like you said, you're mentioning Proverbs, you're mentioning different different things of wisdom that the Bible gives. I've heard of people getting rich just by reading Proverbs, you right. know, because there's a lot of wisdom there. So I know there's a there's a clash of the two. Like there's money, you can serve money, and you can serve God and blend the two and use money as a tool and, and see the dep depreciation of money and the value of of the things that God has given us. So man, if you can't kind of blend the two together, like how does God and money blend? Okay. You got it. So you guys know a little bit of my backstory, right? Yeah. So it says the, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, yeah. all kinds, not just one. Mm -hmm. not, people try to say the love of money is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Mm. Stop for a second. Take a moment. Think about that. Where where is money? I want to ask you guys a question now. Where is money truly evil? Where is it shown? Where is it manifested in true evil? Where is it at? The what I, what comes to mind? Like I think of some really like I, I have a true crime mindset. Like I I have heard of a lot of crazy <laughs> things going on in the dark web, you know, because people want they they see. Uh, people lust after certain things i'm trying to be careful what i say because it gets crazy dark right. but because they lust after certain things they will pay money to reach that lust and that's that's how i see the you know evil coming into that picture so 
it, it can manifest in pride. It can manifest in lust. It can manifest in cars. It can manifest in house. It can manifest in gambling. It can manifest in overeating. I mean, the love, the root of what is what is money? When it asks that scripture, what is that word money? What are they trying to say? Mm. It's an object. It's, yeah. the, it's the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. It's the goal so, behind the goal. What it, yeah, there you go. Explain that. The goal behind the goal being I'll sacrifice this now for what's bigger later. Um, like gym per se. I would like to stay in good health. I like going to the gym. Um, so I'm going to sacrifice drink a pop all day so that I can chug a gallon of water and go to the bathroom nonstop, which is annoying. But I choose that over drink and pop so that I can best benefit from the gym. Why? Because why my, why? My, what? my overall goal with that is I want to make sure that I'm strong enough to take care of my kids, make sure go. that my body's durable enough to be put through anything. I, I don't want my body to break down. Um, and if it ever comes to physically defending my kids, I can do it. There you go. So that that's a really good uh, – objective you know what i'm saying so think about the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil money is just uh, a representation of that thing so that thing that is like the root of all evil that thing is the roots of all kinds of evil so money is just a representation of what you're trying to fulfill so the reality of it is is when did i have that that clash moment i'll tell you when i had that clash moment I had that clash moment when I was working really, really crazy hours and I was killing myself. I'm talking crazy hours, right? And I couldn't afford to buy my family groceries. Mm. And I was like, God, what am I doing here? So I started to evaluate my life and looking into it a little bit. And I started saying, okay, God, teach me how I should see this. And the first scripture he brought to my attention was this, man. He says, if, a, if you're faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many. Hmm. So then the first thing that I had to do is like, okay, God, what do you mean by that? And the first thing I felt was him saying was, man, you got it. You got to start taking care of, dude, I lost everything at this point in time. This is where rubber meet the road. I had a brand new house, lost it, brand new car, lost it, a uh, brand new truck, lost it, boat, lost it. I was homeless. I literally went homeless and had to move into my mother-in-law's garage, single car garage. I sat in the back of a service van crying like a schoolgirl, And I felt God come into that van that day. And I tell God, I'm sitting in the back, dude, on a bucket, you know? And I said, God, I, I'm trying. I'm giving it all I got. And God says, you need to start to reset and evaluate. So guys, I'm going to be transparent with you. At that point in time, I did file bankruptcy straight up. I had to, I had no choice. You know what I'm saying? So 30 days, we lived in that garage. 30 days, I put a poster on the back of the door. I had two kids at the time. I have five now. I had two kids at the time. And on within 30 days, I moved into my own house over on Eureka on the west side. Okay. And when I did that, God gave me true insight into that. And I started reading Proverbs. I fell in love with it. And I started to realize that what I was buying was stuff that was not important. The new car, the new truck came with payments. Both of them did. God put me in a red, ugly as crap station wagon that looked like off the movie Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. <laughs> yeah, I was driving that, okay? <laughs> All pride went out the window, okay? Yeah. And when that happened, man, you, you guys got to understand at that point in time, you're talking nearly 20 years ago, no, 23 years ago. And when this happened, 23 years ago. And I was making probably about $30, $40 an hour. Wow. wow. He was like, well, how did you screw that up? You know what I'm saying? Because I was living the American lie. Hmm. I had a car, had a house, had a truck, had boats. I had everything you could think about. And I was trying to buy identity. I was yeah. trying to high roll. You know hmm. what I'm saying? And, and screwed it all up, dude. Messed it all up. So when did God come into the picture? God started showing me, you're trying to find your identity in this stuff. And by you trying to find your identity in this stuff, you haven't found your identity in me. Wow. God yeah. said, fall in love with me. And when that aspect of money just simply didn't have a value, it just yeah. lost its value. I yeah. stopped caring 
you know, what, what people may have thought of me, even though it may have not even been true. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's what I perceived from all the lies that Satan had told me and, and being the insecure that I was, that all these lies were just lies. And people would say, well, I'm not that way. Yeah, you are. It's real simple. Let me ask you a question. All right. I wonder, just wonder how many people who are not trying to get wealthy that are paying the lottery. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. How many times somebody said, well, no, man, I'm, I don't care about that dude. I'm fine. I'm happy. I'm content with what Satan I am. And oh, man, what if I hit the mega millions? What will I do with that? And you ask him, well, what would you do with that? What, what's that answer? What y'all, y'all know the answer. You've talked, you've had these conversations. Yeah. What did they say? <laughs> I'm gonna buy a new car. I'm gonna start buying stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, yeah. What? Why? Go on why? vacation, Disneyland, Disney World. They're not content. That's it, man. Try That's the biggest thing. The, that I think the funniest statistic is that of that is people who win the lottery are either dead or flat broke in five years Bang. after winning the lottery. That's a statistic. Hundred percent correct. Yeah. So when God came into the picture, John, now I've been able to truly help a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, we've been able to do things in ministry. At one point in time, we took our entire church to Tennessee at one point. And I think it was like $50,000 or something oh, like wow. that. Wow. And uh, awesome. the uh, uh, things like that we used to do all the time. Shoot, Joe was a part of a few of those trips. We went to Mohican back in the day. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> let, but, let, me ask, let me ask this question real quick, okay? Yeah. What's the difference between being content but not satisfied? So, like, because I can be content. I'm trying to relate this to what I know and what I, what I enjoy doing. Uh, I can be content every day going to the gym. I'm content in that moment of today I'm in the gym, I'm doing back and by, or I'm mm. doing chest try, shoulders, legs, whatever. I'm content that day. I might look at myself as I'm passing, walking out the gym and be like, hey, that was a good pump. All right, I'm getting in the car. But <laughs> what keeps me going is because I'm like, I, I'm not satisfied with just that, but I'm content with that was a good workout. Mm -hmm. But there's more for tomorrow to come back and do. So does that make, is that the same thing as what you're talking about here with, with, Finances. I, I think I understand the question. So you're basically asking me what's the difference between content and complacent, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. All right. So this is the situation, man. I'm not complacent. You know what I mean? The Bible is very clear. He talks about the three talents, right? You all know the yeah. scripture about the three talents, yeah. right? But the one, the one lazy one, he said, you lazy, good for nothing servant. I gave you a talent, you buried it, and then you dug it back up and it had gained no interest. At least take it to the bank, put it in the bank. God's mad. Yeah. So he's gave you talents, gifts, and abilities, right? So let's go. Let's let's switch it just a little bit. Proverbs thirty-one. All right. Proverbs thirty-one is normally identified as what a woman should be to her husband. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So check this out. Proverbs thirty-one, man. She goes and buys a field with her money. Mm -hmm. Whoa, whoa, whoa! I thought that she barefoot in the kitchen and take care of the man, right? <laughs> right. I thought that's what it was. No, nah, no, nah. that's not what happens. So what, what happens is, is that it's a husband and wife. We, we are a team. We're me and my wife, man, we're in business together. We're a team. We work very, very hard, but we're not complacent. Faith without works is what? Dead. Dead. Okay. Let me explain it this way. I built, I heard this prayer my whole life, you know, especially from my mom, bless her heart. She's the sweetest lady in the world. She'd be like, I believe that God's going to give me a mansion on the hill. Praise the Lord. You know, <laughs> and, uh, the reality, <laughs> but the reality was, is like, you know, faith of that works is dead. You dream. I hear your dreams. I hear all these things that you're trying to do, but man, I got to keep it real with you. If we don't stop, start taking steps in that direction, God is not a sugar daddy. Hmm. Right. You know, he is a good father. Let me explain what that means. I didn't give my kids a dime to buy any houses. I don't know if y'all know that. People like assume, oh, well, Bill must have helped them out. No, absolutely not. Nor will I pay for their college. Hmm. First, you gotta, I got to believe that. The reality of it is, <laughs> uh, the reality of it is, is why? That's kind of jacked up, dude. No, it's not jacked up. Yeah. If you want it, 
you're going to get it. Now, I will give you something more profitable, something better than any dime I can give you. I want to give you knowledge. I want to teach you how to do it. We're mm-hmm. going to get educated. We're going to learn together. So me and Noah yeah. right now are in the real estate business together. We have a whole other business, uh, Radoff Group Investments. And me and Noah, um, it does that. My, my son does that. And it's one of those things where you got a realization that sits in is that it comes down to complacent or contentment. Yeah. Some people are just lazy. Yeah. Hmm. It ain't. It ain't contentment. That ain't contentment. Well, I'm just, praise God, I'm just glad to be here. I'm going to work my job. I'm going to sit home. Now I'm done. No, that's not scripture at all. Hmm. You can't read Proverbs and get that anywhere. Yeah. You can't, not only that, dude, you can't read anywhere in the Bible, even the New Testament, going back to Matthew with the talents. You can't, you can't do that. God's basically saying, I will honor you. I will give you favor, but you're going to have to work for it. The yeah. l- the land that Abraham had obtained. Do you know the story of how he obtained that land? I don't know. It. <laughs> That's a good guy. Yeah, I am not That's an it. Old Testament guy, dude. I mean, I love Old Testament. I'm just not there yet. So please inform me. All right, I'm gonna give you the bill version. Okay. Yeah. God didn't. God just didn't come down and say, "Hey, Abraham, what's up, man? I love you so much. You know, you just keep sitting on that log by that lake there and chilling, relaxing. You know, and I'm just gonna give you all this land." No, he went to a outside of the land that he was. Right, he went out yeah. from Pharaoh, out by himself. I was Moses. Sorry, he went out with Moses <laughs> and and gained favor and purchased land. Worked his butt off for it. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Uh, Abraham did the same thing. So probably if anybody had it easy, it would have been Isaac. You follow me? Because Isaac inherited. But Abraham was a good father. What does that mean? Here's something else that will blow your mind. Abraham and Ishmael built the temple. Okay? That's his um, son from Hagar, his first Mm -hmm. son from Hagar, right? Well, they built the temple together. And um, Ishmael had also was very prosperous, very wealthy. A lot of people don't realize that. So both of his sons was extremely wealthy, but the one thing that he had given them was hard work, dedication, and grind, man. Mm, Right? So I am content no matter what state that I'm in. What does that mean? Man, I'm happy with my life. I'm very, I'm a pap. Man, my granddaughter is awesome. Yeah. But pap's also working every single day of his life to the bone. I'm not looking for an easy way out. And Noah asked me, Dad, when will you chill out? When will you stop? I said, God hasn't called me to. See, wow. I, I heard this one that everybody has this goal to retire. Everybody has a goal to retire. I don't have a goal to retire. I, I don't. That's not my goal. I, I, I've made that a very defining moment when I was 31 years old that I don't want to ever retire. I don't. I, I don't. I, and I really don't care if I'm out. Maybe I'm hoeing the ground somewhere or you know, maybe I'm out there still digging through units. Whatever it is, I don't want to retire. Uh, it's just I don't want to settle, and I want to make sure that my kids are taken care of when I'm dead and gone. You know, if Jesus comes back first, so be it. But if my kids are still here and I die, I want my kids taken care of. The men that I know in this world that's found freedom, the men that I know that in this world that's truly found freedom, man, they don't let the, they don't let their foot off the gas. It's not in them to do it. But that's also why God gave him favor. And that's also why God still gives him favor. And that's also why that they're the happiest people on earth. And it's because they're content. They're saying, you know what? If I get it, cool. If I don't get it, um, cool. It's not what makes me happy. It's not what makes me tick. But working for my family, working for my legacy, working for God, because God sees me every single day of my life. Man, that's something I can get my head around. That's something I can have faith for. That's something I can go to bed at night and do the best. You know, yeah. sitting around looking forward to just watching TV all night and doing nothing with my time, sleeping in at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I mean, come on, man. I mean, yeah. you see what I'm saying? Waste of time, dude. You're just – and uh, the, read Proverbs, y'all. Read Proverbs, all right? Yeah. That's good, dude. Um, I, I have a question here, man. So – we talked a lot about the poor mentality. Is there a mentality of even the, is there like a difference between actual rich, like they make some money and biblical wealthy 
Is there a difference between the two, like those that have their trust in God and maybe those that don't believe in God but are still rich? Um, can they still be content, like true content? What do you think? I'm not going to say no, but I haven't met one. I mean, sure. that's just a fact. You know, you go to certain areas up here where I live and um, you got people that own $5 million homes that can't get approved for a $5,000 furnace, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and th they look the part, dude. You roll up there. I mean, they're bougie. You know what I'm yep. saying? Yeah. They got the bougie clothes and the bougie attitude. I had a guy with the mini grand piano uh, look me in the face and said, um, man, I, I had a mini grand piano in his living room, right? And he, and he literally starts to cry. And he's like, dude, I can't afford to replace this furnace. What would you do? And at the time, I was just a technician, right? I said, man, I got to be honest with you. I said, I don't have a mini grand piano sitting in my living room. But if my furnace breaks down, I'm not freaking out. You know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. Said, uh, so you asked me what I would do. I'd probably sell the piano. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. And the guy looked yeah. at me. He looked at me like I was crazy. He wow. looked at me like I was out of my mind. Like I can't do that. And I'm like, well, okay, then don't have heat. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah. <laughs> but, I, uh, yeah. I tell you the the perfect picture. I think of this is you look at uh, you know I love basketball. You guys know I do. So, but you look at the NBA, and you look at like like the Dwight Howard or like Le LeBron or Dwayne Wade. And I think those are the people that you would say was a fake rich, but you look at the quiet Leonard still driving a 97 Bronco dudes living with his mom and he's an all-star dudes making millions a year. Doesn't have a phone. Like <laughs> smart, wow. smart man. What? You know what I mean? But like <laughs> his wow. agent handles everything for him. He's hired an agent. He handles everything. He don't have a phone. If only, he could, if only he could contact the agent. That's the only thing, man. If only. What does See it matter? That? They say practice is nine o'clock. He's there. The agent meets him there. I mean, it don't matter. You know, like he's got a schedule. He sticks to the schedule, but he's just content, man. I mean, his mom lives in a nice house, but it's not a mansion. I mean, but you look at LeBron. He's got a six-car garage. He's probably in so much debt. Yeah, he's making $93 million a year, but how much debt is he in? Now, a lot of this stuff, man, I'm telling you, like, I don't want to get the wires crossed. Is there at any point that it's okay to to buy something? You know what I'm saying? Is at any point, is it okay? Right. Yeah, yeah, when it's not your identity. Right. Dude, right. I love to yeah. ride my bike. I love to ride a Harley. You know what I I'm saying? I don't do ride my bicycle. Sorry. Yeah, that yeah. one. Yeah. You know? <laughs> but at the same time, I don't have to have it. It's not my identity. I'm not going to put my family in jeopardy to own it. Um, and I, I just, it's not who I am, who I am in crisis, who I am, but I love the ride. That's something I really have fun doing. Does that make sense? Yeah. Joe, the dude I was telling you about, I dropped his name. just <laughs> the, the dude I was telling you about, okay. The, the, so one of his business for $75 million, yeah. dude, he's, he's got four barns full of cars, four barns. So it, it's okay to have things. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. It's all right to have things. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having things. It's a problem when your identity is in that stuff. Yeah. When you're saying, hey, look at my Bugatti. You know, look at these right. chains. Look at these, look at these clothes that I'm wearing. Look at who I am. Status is just as guilty of the rich. Status, yeah. you know, people, churches can be very guilty for it, man. Yeah. Yeah. Look who I am. Look what I've done in church. Look who I am. No, what about, let's look at Ooh, God. Come on, You know man. what I'm saying? Yeah. So all of these things, dude, when you're trying to steal God's identity, that's oh. a problem too. Yeah. Uh, you know? So to answer your question, John, is there a difference between, there is a difference between poverty. There is a difference between the middle class. There is a difference between rich. And there is a huge difference between wealthy and a mass gap there. Okay. Wow. The mentality, you'll say the rich is high earning income. Okay. Yeah. The wealthy don't have an income like that. They don't have an earned income like that. They have assets. They have capital gains. They have uh, dividends. They have passive income. They have um, um, they may have a, an earned income in there somewhere tucked in, but that's not even a, that big of a deal to them. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and it's why? Because they don't need it. They don't need it to say, look at me. I'm the beast. You know what I mean? Look at the car yeah. I drive. Look at the clothes that I wear. You know, man, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm even goofier than that when it comes to like shoes that I buy. I got three pairs of the exact same shoe and I wear those every day. 
And yeah. I just like those shoes. That Kevin O'Leary, you ever heard of him? Yes. Where have I heard that? Uh, all right. Kevin O'Leary's on, yeah. uh, he's on, oh, what's that? Oh, yeah. Uh, Shark Tank. Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. That dude has, he wears that black suit. He has 25 of them. Wow. He wears the same exact the same suit. suit. <laughs> 25 of them. Okay. Yeah. And the reality of it is, is he's not in it for the bling. They said Mark Cuban won't hire any um, servants to clean his house. And they're like, well, what's I got to do with the price rise to China? Because Mark said, I never want to forget where I'm coming from. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah. the reality of when you talk about the real wealthy and they said, well, buying the wizards, wouldn't that have been a status symbol? And his response was no, it was a business decision. Yeah. Do you see what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. So the the reality of it is when we start looking at the real wealth now with the only problem that I would honestly say is some people I wish that they would find their identity in Christ and not their identity in wealth. You yeah. can also find your identity in wealth. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? I'm yeah. secure. I'm safe. I'm secure because I have money. No, I'm safe and I'm secure because I have Jesus. Does yeah. that make sense? That's you know, so. you know, there was a uh, a word that me and John talked about this past week that I thought was incredible. Um, that I feel like the Holy Spirit kind of dropped on me. So at work, I have to go by the name Anthony because work messed up and put my name Anthony on my tag and on my board and all this crap. Man, I hate it so much. I do. I can't stand it. And uh, so I was, it was, I was about to call Jonathan. We and him usually talk on our way our first call and uh, start thinking about it. And I was like, man, I hate I hate that. You know, like <laughs> right. that. I got to go. Hey, this is Anthony. I'm on my way. You know. And uh, before I felt like the Holy Spirit, there was another incident that happened. Don't want to get into that one because it's a little, it's bad. But um, there's another incident that happened. I was trying to remember the guy's name, what happened with him. And our names are not important. Our identity, because a lot of times, like, you think Bill, Bill Ralph. You know, and I've heard this question uh, on different series of podcasts I listen to. About, Who are you? Who are you, Bill? You know, and well, uh, I'm a dad, I'm a business owner, I'm a pat. Uh, no, no, but who are you? You're telling me all the things of what's your label, but who are you? And you're, you're who you are, the contents of your heart is way more important than identity of your name. And the contents of your heart is what you do. Yeah, that's, that's fact. It's the outward. So out of the mouth, out of the bones of the mouth speaks is the contents of our heart. And Absolutely. Uh, I think, I don't know, I, I, I've enjoyed this because this, phew, yeah, because it, it all starts with the mindset, man. You got to get your mind right. Dude, I'm not going to lie. That That's the key to everything. So when it comes down to like passive income and trying to create systems for business and all this good stuff, and uh, a lot of people's like, well, I, I'm not even trying to be there. I don't want to try. Man, there's a lot of things that they do that says different. You know what I mean? Yeah. Your, your actions speak louder than words. In other words, then why is your passion to buy the new car and get into that much debt? Why is your passion to to do that kind of stuff? You know, it, it says a whole lot about you and you don't even realize it says about you is because we're trying to find our identity. And we, man, we're all human. We're all oh, yeah. human. We all do it and we all have slips every now and then. So, so what would you suggest? What I suggest is, is, first of all, I think the obvious answer, dig into God. All right. Secondly, what is the second of answer is keep, don't quit your day job. You ever heard that saying? Don't quit your day job. Okay. <laughs> what does that mean? Find your side hustle until your side hustle becomes your primary hustle. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah. But you got to go all in faith without yeah. works is dead. You absolutely have to go all in. You have to dig for it. You have to grind for it. You have to give it all you got. So yeah. Does it take time? Yeah. Is it going to be hard work? Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be hard work. Is it going to be challenging? Well, without a doubt, man, it's going to be challenging, but yeah. at the end of it, is it worth it? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. It's worth it. A hundred percent. Third of all, don't, Treat God's money with disrespect. If mm. you when you if you are spending God's money on dumb stuff, there's the love of money manifested. Yeah, you know that's yeah. good. That's good, man. That is if, good. I have a question here. So, in the Bible, Jesus mentions a rich man. He said that uh, it's harder for a rich man to. It's easier for uh, someone to enter into the eye of the needle. Camel. And a rich man and to uh, yeah, the camel. It's easier for a camel to enter the island needle than a rich man to get in heaven. 
Thank you, but Joel. I appreciate it goes that. because the identity of the rich man. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Correct. He's already found his identity. He's already like, this is who I am. So he's got right. status. you got to think about Zacchaeus, you know, a little short dude climbed up in a tree. Okay. Yeah. They yeah. Come, come down, Zacchaeus. I'm going to your house today. All right. Yeah. The reality is not that Zacchaeus wasn't about to get saved, which I do believe he gave his heart to God. Um, the reality of it is, is that Zacchaeus had already found his identity in things. Is you know, it, he, yeah, because he was loaded, right? Yeah. Yeah. I don't need you to tell me what I need to fix. You're poor. You know what I'm saying? That That's the problem. But can it happen? Well, it talks about the camel going through an eye of a needle. Well, we know that the gate in the city is called the eye of a needle. Okay. Right. It ain't talking about a thread needle. It's right. talking about the gate in the city being at the eye of the needle. Okay. Camels would have to basically get on all four and crawl through the eye of the needle and come out the other side. Yeah. They never said that you couldn't do it. They said it was difficult for you to do right. it. Okay. Sure. First of all, there's two ways of looking at it. You're either very rich trying to get saved. And that's what the Bible's talking about. That's difficult. Right. Or you're saved genuinely knowing who you are in Christ, working with God's favor, grinding, not being lazy, not spending God's money on stupid stuff, and then finding legacy and wealth. Yeah. You, amen? Yeah. 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 So. yeah, that's good. So so to have the I'm, – I'm going to have to go. I actually have a work thing I got to get to. Uh, I was trying to push it all the way up to the – Last second. No worries, bro. But let me let me get this straight in my head before I go, though, because I'm I'm still going. I'm going to watch. Uh, but the poverty mindset and the rich mindset both are bad. The poor mindset is the desperation. I'm doing this out of desperation. The rich mindset is I'm going to buy a golden camel and throw it in my living room just because I think it looks cool. <laughs> and when people come in, I want them to be like, oh, oh my gosh, look at my camel. You know what I mean? <laughs> that Right? Like, it's simplicity of it, yeah. Absolutely, man. You look at Lazarus and the rich man. I mean, you know, Lazarus sitting at his gate begging for money, you know, and the rich man's like, no, go go get a job and make your own money. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. That, that's a hardness of heart, you know what I mean? And that's the rich man wanting to hang on to his money. It's simple as that, you know what I mean? And uh, next thing you know, the rich man dies and goes to uh, hell. You know, well, we got to take it into context. You know, you got Abraham that was wealthy. You got Isaac that was wealthy. You got David that was wealthy. You got Solomon that was wealthy. And none of those dudes went to hell. You know, why? What's the difference? The rich man was a narcissist who loved himself and didn't want to spend his money. You know right. what I'm saying? And yeah. the poor man sitting at the gate was in need. And, and he didn't see or fulfill the need in any form. We're not talking about giving him money, putting him on payroll, we're talking about giving him some food and water. Wow. Okay. Man, I just had a connection. Two thoughts here. Rich man came to Jesus and he said, how do I get into heaven? How do I achieve paradise? Jesus said, go sell your crap and come back and follow me. And the dude oh, never came back. Wouldn't do it. So I thought about this because you guys know the different events I've been through in my life. And uh, in those events, I lost my identity. And um, for the secrecy of those who may watch this, um, I lost my identity in each of those and had to quickly shuffle things around to find a new identity. And then that fell through and then I had to shuffle through and find a new identity. Um, but the reason the rich man didn't come back is because of his identity and his possessions. That's fact. Because I was going to ask what well, that was one of my questions is why didn't the rich man ever come back? Like, what is that? But he didn't because of his identity and his possessions. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I think cool. it's, yeah. I think it was the thing why Job never fell apart. Yeah. Because his identity was in Christ, not in stuff. Wow, so he lost, yeah. lost all of his stuff, lost his kids. Had Man, probably the worst thing that he had was a wife in his ear. It was like, <laughs> curse God and die. You know? He's like, shoot, why didn't you kill her? You know? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm just joking. <laughs> what do they say? It's better to, to, to dwell on the rooftop of a house than to live with a contentious woman. And I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> poor Job was a broke man. You know, he's broke, <laughs> I'm all jacked up. You know, this he still had to deal with that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but, you know, I, I don't know if she ever got it together or not. The poor guy. 
You yeah. know, and uh, the reality of it is, is Job did get all the stuff back, but his stuff was not where his heart was. No. Mm. And so the reality is what happens to the rich man had to sell the Ooh. stuff. Couldn't do it, man, because his heart was there. You know what I'm That's saying? Yeah. So yeah. Can, you, can you gain wealth without your heart being there? Absolutely, you can gain yeah. wealth without your heart being there. But if your heart's in the wealth, there's a bigger problem. It's just a bigger right. problem. Yeah. And, oh, I think this, okay. Man, I, I just got I just got a uh, epiphany, revelation, whatever you want to call it. But I've found a common theme with those that are wealthy, and it's resiliency. Like, I feel like every wealthy person has a broke story where they oh. were completely broke, and it was resiliency that caused them to make it on top. They were resilient because they didn't have their identity in the things. They had goals. They had dedication. They had resiliency. They had grind. And Joel, dude, if you have to go, man, I understand, dude. Uh, this I'm just be... enjoying it so much. I'm okay. actually five minutes, six minutes now past my time. If you don't, it's going to help you in the end. And listen to me, man. I have a lot to learn. I have a lot to grow. And Bill's helped me a lot so far. But, uh, would you agree that resiliency is is I mean that that would be part of that not having your identity in things because okay everything's gone I'm either gonna you know God God forgive me or people will forgive me I'm either gonna kill myself or I'm gonna move on and keep you know keep moving or I'm gonna get into so much despair that I'm going to follow the trend keep up with the Joneses there's a lot of despair to get into. Or you can be resilient and know, hey, my identity is not in my work, this person over here, you know, or the things that I do or the things that I gain. What if nothing mattered? Mm. Yeah. What wow. if it just didn't matter? Like yeah. stuff. You know, I, I, let me tell you something, man, straight up. All right. The first time that I hit a million dollars, I was like, this is it. This is yeah. what I've been waiting on. Wow. Yeah. This kind of sucks. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And why? Because you're like, it's just not what I thought. You know what I'm saying? It's yeah. just not what I thought. Now, now, there's a point that I'm getting to with saying that. You know, then you get to the second and you're like, it still is the first. Wow. Yeah. And then you get to the third and you're like, we like the first. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. why? Why? Because then you begin to realize that this things just doesn't matter as much. It's like yeah. they don't nothing. What does matter? What does matter is the people around you. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. But you got to love yourself before you can love your neighbor as yourself. So love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You got to love yourself first. And then there's a third one there, you know, which is when I love God, I love myself. I'm able to love my neighbor. Does that make yeah. sense? Ooh, when, yeah. when we understand that the people around us, the community that we build, the lifeblood, it's not something you can buy. It's not something you can purchase, but it is the most valuable thing in the world. So with that said, mentality of the wealthy or said resilience, mm -hmm. this is the answer. Ready? Lean close. What's the worst could happen? Oh, yeah. Mm. What's yeah. the worst could happen? Yeah, that that deletes fear too, man. It's like uh, I have someone very close to my life that deals with fear, um, pretty rough. And I tell that person, I said, "What's the worst that can happen?" I say that a lot, Bill. I do. I tell them like, "What's the worst that happen? What, you know, you go bankrupt? Okay, let's keep moving, keep going. See, There's more fish in the sea. You know what I'm saying? That's it. Keep rocking, baby. Fun, fun fact, real quick: the verse Bill just quoted has been quoted on every episode of this season too so far. What was it? Uh, about, I got to love God with all my heart, love oh, my neighbor yeah. as myself. Wow. Yeah. And it's been explained the same way every time that you, how you just said it. And that's been a big, uh, a big part of residing within me. Uh, okay. Before I go, I want to say this. I love you so much, Uncle Bill. Uh, love you guys. I don't think you understand how much of a father figure you are to me. Um, just I appreciate that. through our lives, the good, the bad, and the ugly, you've always been a father figure to me. Um, you've helped me out through some 
tremendous times that I never thought I was going to survive. And you made it. <laughs> Man, I did. You made um, it, yeah. There's a there's something you just said, and I think this is one of the biggest things that I learned during that time of talking to you. Me and you have had this conversation before about taking away the safety net. Uh, I remember being in Oklahoma about to climb up on the roof, and we was having this conversation because I was listening to this guy by the name of David Goggins, and he was talking about ripping away your safety net. Carry the logs. And... He's going to carry the logs. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I think the way that I like to say it is, me and Shane say this all the time, is they can't take your birthday. They take everything else. They can't take your birthday. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it, it is what it is. You're just going to keep rolling, you know. You can't kill but me. That's it, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love you guys. Love you guys, Enjoy. Too, Don't get in trouble. <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> right, See you guys. Love See you, buddy. Um, okay, so real quick, man. Um, I mean, you've given us so much. I don't want to take all your time. I know you got family to, to get back to. But if you don't mind, i got one more question, and that is – some people on here, you may have stepped on some toes, man. You may have been like, hey, this is the way out. you got to think wisely. you got to think about what has value, what doesn't have value. Man, those that, I mean, you've stepped on my toes in a few areas for sure. Um, but how would you tell those people? Okay, maybe someone's stuck. Maybe someone's bankrupt. Maybe someone's in a bad position finance, financially. What's your advice to the next step? What's their next step? Um, okay, you're either a part of the 99% or you're a part of the 1%, okay? Mm. If you're part of the 99%, go get your David Ramsey's uh, software and do it. All right? Do it. <laughs> if you're a part of the 1%, you're going to take a different path. Mm. And what does that mean? Uh, Dave Ramsey's oh, and now I, I like Dave Ramsey, and he's a part of the 99%. And what I mean, he does help a lot of people that need help. Okay. A lot of people's in debt and live in scarcity and, and, you know, you know, starve the cat and pay the debt. I get all that. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but the reality of it is, is um, if your ambition is to be the 1%, then you got to be the 1%. Yeah. And what, what does that mean? The 1% are going to take a little risk, the risk involved. You know, there's straight up risks involved. Uh, it's not for the faint of heart. It's not for the average person uh, when it comes to the 1%. Did God call us to the 1%? I think God called us to be extraordinary, set apart, set aside, different, you know. Um, yeah. Not everybody in the Bible was Abraham. You know, Paul was content too. So Abraham was content, but so was Paul. Paul spent his time in a seven by seven cell. Okay, Paul was awaiting death row. When he wrote, when he wrote to the Philippians in chapter four, that said, "Whatever is good, whatever is honest, whatever is great, focus on these things." Okay, yeah. Paul was not loaded. Paul did not have a ton of land. Paul had to give up his riches. There's the eye of the needle. Eye of the needle. Sorry, Paul yeah. had to give. Paul had to give up his riches. Yeah. In order to find God. Okay, he had to sell everything, get out of that the whole mess, guys. He was the vim bit den. Paul was. The man, you know, he was like the second in charge of the Sanhedrin. You know, when they stoned Stephen, right, they laid their cloaks at Paul's feet. That was Paul's thumbs up for saying kill Stephen, right? Yeah. There's a high probability that Paul might have been the guy that called the death of Jesus, you know? Wow. Because that's yeah. what the Ben Bet Den did. That's what his job was. Does wow. that make sense? Yeah. So the reality of it is you're talking about a guy that had to give up everything, everything, to be in a seven by cell in Jerusalem, waiting death row to get his head chopped off. Yeah. And he's talking about focusing on all the good things in life and being content wow. no matter what state that he's in. Yeah. Right. Contentment doesn't have a price tag on it. Mm. What I'm trying to say is if God has called you to a bigger calling, and, 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 and no matter what that is, whether you're Paul or whether you're an Abraham, okay. Right. In my life, I prayed to be an Abraham. I wanted to change the legacy of financial disaster in my life. I didn't yeah. want to raise my family in the projects. I wanted to say, God, I want freedom in all aspects of it. God, will you grant me this? Mm. Right. And the reality of it is freedom came through education. Freedom came through not my value in wealth, 
it's the result of wealth. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. These this mindset, this understanding, this one percent. Okay, but can I be Paul? Absolutely, man. Can you be Timothy? Absolutely. Not everybody in the Bible was loaded. You right. know, I've heard preachers say, "Well, Jesus told um, Luke to go pay alms." You know what I'm saying? That didn't mean Jesus was loaded. You know what I mean? It means that he had a little bit of money, maybe. You know, sure. but that that was not the point. That's sure. not the point. Even talking about wealth and and those are, that's not the point. Yeah. The the point is being content no matter what state you're in, not finding your identity in stuff that don't generate income. You can be a basic, you know, human and and follow the call. Maybe God's called you to missions. Then you're probably not going to be this big wealthy guy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's it's about contentment. And the, the end of the story is really about contentment. Yeah. And what does that mean? That means if I'm buying stuff that I can't afford and I'm using God's money to buy that stuff that I can't afford, then I'm probably putting myself in a bad position that's going to hurt my family, that's going to hurt me, and I'm doing it because I haven't found my identity in Christ. I'm yeah. doing it because I haven't said, God, I'm good enough. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Does that's that really sense? good, man. That's great. That's a great way to end the show, man. If you're good, unless you have something else to talk about, because you've, I mean, you've given us some great stuff to think about mull on until the next time we have you on here. Cause I mean, there's so much stuff. I, I have a lot of questions here. I would like to just, oh man, I'd like to pick your brain on some more things, but this has been really good, man. I really appreciate you for sure. Um, if you could one more thing, one more thing. Yeah, Absolutely. How could somebody reach Christ? Maybe they have never even given Christ a thought. How would you lead them to Christ? Oh, man, let me tell you right now. First of all, this uh, happened the other day, actually, uh, in uh, our freedom group. I had a guy ask me a question, and this is what I looked at him, and, and this is what God put in my heart to say. God don't love your mistakes. He don't love the things that you did wrong, but he does love you. There's nothing that you'll be able to do to win his love. There's nothing you'll be able to do to earn his love. It says that all the laws of the prophet rest on these two things, that we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength, and we love our neighbor ourselves. All the rules, all the commandments, Jesus came to fulfill the law. You're human. You're going to make mistakes. You are mistakes. Now, we don't live by grace. We live by faith. What does that mean? Man, I'm giving my best out here. I really am. I'm, but I'm human and I make mistakes. Do I get angry? I do. And no, I, I did. Get angry and sin not, brother. No, I get angry and sin. Okay, <laughs> straight up. Call it like it is. Okay. <laughs> then I'll have to call up God. Like, God, I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. Yeah. I, I'm sorry that I made this mistake. But he never stopped loving me through that. He knows that I know that I'm going to own my sin. Yeah. The reality of it is, man, is that we're all human. That's it. We put these standards, we put these these boxes on ourselves. And if we don't check the boxes, then we're not saved. But God will meet you where you're at. He will come to you. He says, I see you. I love you. Let me be your identity. Let me show you your value. I, I don't need you to show the value that God has in you to the world. No, no, no. I'm going to show you how great you are because I love you and I see your value. So man, it's real simple. When you're talking about giving your heart to God, well, I'm not done with this thing yet. I'm not done over here, man. I'm not ready. I haven't got my life together. Okay. Uh, real quick news. You're never going to, hmm. it'll never come. There's always going to be something that God's going to have you working on. Don't give your heart to God for anybody other than yourself. Hmm. God does love you. He sees you. He wants to be a part of your life. Man, he accepted a fool like me with all these lies that Satan have plagued on me, with all these things. And he looks at me and he says, I see a good dad. I see a good husband. I see a father. And yeah. I didn't see any of that crap, dude. I didn't see any of it. I saw a mess. Wow. And God saw life. Gosh, that's so good. Dude. That's so good, man. Thanks for being so vulnerable and real, man. I appreciate it. I really do. Bill, this has been a great episode, dude. And you've given us so much uh, to really think about talking about the 
the poor mentality to the rich mentality versus true wealth mentality uh, based off the Bible, man. The Bible is so much to give us. If we will just read it and soak in what God has for us, true wisdom. You know, the, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God, fearing what God can actually do to you if you do not follow him. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's the fear of God. But, Bill, I know you got a place to go, brother. You got people to see. I appreciate your time, man. I really do. Thank you. Thanks for having me, man. It's been a great show. I love you, man. I love you. Love what Bye. you guys are doing. Good job. Thanks, buddy. Bye. Bye-bye. Man, that's Bill Ratliff, guys. Oh, I love it. Yeah, we need a part two, Joel. Joel's got on here. He's got part two. Bill, uh, I know he got you in the waiting room, brother. You can uh, let yourself go if you want, or you can stick around. It's up to you, man. I just want to give you that time. But, guys, thank you for sticking around, man. We got a lot of views going on. Uh, within our Facebook, within our YouTube page. And that was your episode three of Faith Chronicles. It was so good. Being the steward of your money, we talked about the poor mentality. We talked about the rich mentality. And we talked about being wealthy. Man, there's so much to grow in, guys. There's so much we can do on this earth for Christ. It's hard to do it if you're so worried about the, the finite things of this world. If you're so worried about money, you're so worried about what's my ne- what's my next paycheck going to be. Listen, there's a wise way to go about this. And we talked about this. Uh, we've talked about that in this episode. So if you didn't catch all of it, it's going to be on Facebook. I've got a Facebook group page right here. Go to www.facebook.com slash groups slash Faith Chronicles, or you can go to our YouTube page. I don't think I have that here, but it's youtube.com slash at Faith Chronicles. Oh man, there's one more thing I wanted to mention. Uh, I wanted to ask Bill about. I forgot about, but Bill, he's working on a book and I think it's called, right now, it's called Lessons Learned and uh, if you want to know more about Bill Ratliff, I'm sure you can hit him up on Facebook. And if you got some furnace and AC needs in Columbus, Ohio, <laughs> if you're in Columbus, Ohio, hit up Rightway Heating and Cooling, rightwayhvac.com. Go to his website and you can see what he's doing there uh, with Rightway Heating and Cooling. So, man, awesome things in store for that man right there. And uh, he got man, he is resilient, he's doing awesome things. So, thank you again, Bill. Appreciate it, man. You've been a great influence in my life. So, everybody out there, thank you for, for your comments, thank you for sticking around and, and, and commenting and throwing out Bible scriptures and all that stuff. Uh, we got here, we got some comments up here. Um, my mother is on here, she knows she said that he knows we're made of dust, but he loves us in spite of ourselves. Beautiful, beautiful beautiful we had some stuff up here steve riddles he said you can do good with money as well like pay someone's rent that's that's right or someone's house hey hey steve man if god ever lays it on your heart no, I'm joking. I'm joking, dude. i love you steve man it's good to see it he said or someone's house mortgage payment or car payment amen amen Oh, uh, we got the random blogs guy here. He says he loved this episode. Man, I appreciate you being a part of this. Listen, guys, you can also support Faith Chronicles. Uh, We have dreams. We have visions for this podcast. And we as well want to do great things with the money that God has given us. You can go. Do the cash app, dollar sign Faith Chronicles for you. If you want to support Faith Chronicles, you can go to our cash app there and support us any way that you want. We we want this thing to be the 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 have the best quality of any podcast. I want to make a studio of my own. So I'm gonna invest um, as much money as I can into this podcast. And we want to have the people uh with with Joel, uh, where Joel's at, we want we want him to have the place and Shane to have a place. Our co-hosts on here. I have a bug.
There you are. Okay, I was muted. I had a bug on my curtain, and it was distracting me. So, anyways, here we are. This was an awesome episode. I thank Bill for being on here once again. Guys, next week, stay tuned, because I'm working on a couple things. It's either going to be one person or the other. I have my uncle Lonnie in the waiting uh, to either he's going to be on here to tell you some amazing things that God has done in his life recently. God had he had a visitation with God. God shared with him 10 things that he should do in his life before he goes to heaven, before he passes on, just like all of us. 100 percent of people <laughs> pass on. But we also have another guy named Mike Evans. We are also working on getting this these videos into an actual podcast setting in podcast. So uh, that's audio, audio only. Another thing we're working on are apparel. We're working on uh, putting our designs on t-shirts and putting our designs on hoodies, as well as certain quotes that our guests have had, if my camera will uh, bring itself in focus camera all right there we go we also want to have our quotes the quotes of certain guests every guest on the t-shirts don't that sound awesome so we're gonna have the big shield logo on uh, on the shirt somewhere as long as as uh, uh, as well as the motto of uh the faith chronicles true stories of people encountering the extraordinary god we're gonna have that on the t-shirts we have quotes of the visitors on the t-shirts as well so everybody thank you for being on here thanks for your comments thanks for your spectating and your participating i appreciate it god bless you guys you all have a wonderful day i hope your week is amazing give us a shout out as well on our uh google we got a google gmail account i'm going to look it up here so that i can give it to you it is faith chronicles for you at gmail.com. Um, I, okay, I just had it. Where'd you go? Okay, one second, guys. Sorry, I had it here. Faith chronicles for you at gmail. I'm going to put it on here for you. Give me some time. That way, you guys can give us some prayer requests. Here it is, faithchronicles for you at gmail.com. You can send out uh, um, any prayer requests that you have. Send it to our Gmail. Any questions, any comments. If God has given you some crazy experiences, you had some crazy encounters with God. If you have, uh, if you want to be on Faith Chronicles, give us a shout out at, at faithchronicles for you at gmail.com. We have some crazy uh, plans for this podcast. So. God bless you guys. Thank you for being on here. We have so much in store for you in the future. Just stay tuned. This was episode three of your Faith Chronicles.